Hello, and welcome to the video lecture for chapter 13 on the topic of liquids. Okay. All right, so here we're going to get into discussing ideas of pressure, because liquids can exert pressure on their surroundings, what that means to have pressure in a liquid, a big topic, buoyancy. Um, buoyancy directly leads to the idea of Archimedes' principle. Um, and then on that, on that matter, that's what makes objects sink and float. How a boat can float, for example, is of course due to buoy uh, buoyancy. And specifically the idea of flotation, creating flotation through certain shapes. Then we have something a bit different, which is Pascal's principle. This one is all about energy conservation. Okay, it's just uh, energy conservation by a different name, but you'll see it in the context of fluids, it makes sense. And then we got a, a couple of sort of auxiliary topics, which are surface tension and capillarity. All right, let's get to it. So let's def define our new unit here, because pressure definitely is a, is a major new unit that we're discussing and is the force per unit area that one object exerts on another, okay? And so it's, you can have, you know, like a pressure pushing on and then a, a kind of reaction pressure, just like forces. You have, a, you have a force pair, you get like a pressure pair, all right? But what pressure is, is it's force normalized by area, which is a technical expression to say something is normalized. Essentially, that means you're dividing by the area. So if I, for example, wanted to talk about the total force that a swimming pool exerts on the, the, the bottom of that pool, then that would, I'd have to know the square footage of the bottom of that pool, right? And it turns out I also have to know the depth of the pool. Okay, and we'll talk about why you would have to know the depth, but point being is you'd have to know the area and then you multiply the force, basically the weight of the water. Um, so I guess it makes sense you have to know the depth because you need to know the total weight of the water. And you just multiply that by the area, right? That'd be your total force. But the thing is that that is really specific because then it's different for every pool. But if instead you divide by the area of the pool, then you have a value, a pressure value, that would be the same for every pool of a, of a particular depth. It doesn't matter the total volume of the pool. That's, that's what normalization means. It means dividing by something to get a more general expression. So pressure is more general than force because we've divided by the area, all right? So that's why we divide by area. It's force per area so that it can be more applicable to many situations. All right. Um, it depends by the area over which the force is distributed. Okay. So, you know, if I, so that's because you need to divide by the area to get the pressure. All right. But it's also independent of the area, depending on the context. Okay. So you can see how it can both go, go both ways. The units, the basic units are the Pascal, all right, which is the Newton per square meter. Because of course, force is measured in Newtons and area is measured in square meters. Okay. Now you can also express it in imperial units, pounds per square foot. We really won't be doing that. So, and mostly we'll be talking about Pascal. So Pascal is a derived unit with a name for Newtons per square meter. And not every derived unit has a name, right? Meters per second don't have a special name, but Newtons per square meter do, and they're called Pascals, all right? Just like Newtons are kilogram meters per second squared, okay? And in terms of base units, by the way, if you think about it, since the Newton is the kilogram um, meter per second squared, and then we're dividing by square meters, then what we're getting is the kilogram over meter seconds, all right? Those are the uh, second squares, excuse me. Those are the units of the Pascal, the, in terms of full-on base units, because of course, N is derived. It's, as I said, the kilogram meter per second squared, okay? All right, so there you go. Those are the units of pressure. All right, so here we have, you know, some ideas, app applications about pressure. So you can, if you spread out force, then, um, then the pressure is much smaller. So here we have a teacher lying on nails is unharmed because the force is applied over many nails. Combined, the combined surface area of all those nail tips results in a tolerable pressure that does not puncture the skin, all right? So that's the idea is that the overall pressure is much smaller. You could also think, you know, like the force at each, at each um, nail is much smaller because it's dividing by all those nails, all right? Uh, on the other hand, you put an apple on the nails, right? It can just sink right into it, all right? Maybe, maybe they dropped that apple, right? So it's able to accelerate into the nails, okay? A bed of nails. So when you stand on one foot instead of two, the force you exert on the floor is, right? This is just make, make sure you have a basic understanding of pressure. One foot instead of two, how would that change the force? Okay? It's the same, right? Because force is independent of area, okay? When you stand on one foot instead of two, the pressure you exert on the floor, okay? I made a big deal with the last one being the same, so you might think this one's not. And you'd be right, it's more. Right? Because if I cut the area in half, I still have the same amount of force, but I have half the area. And since pressure is force per area, cutting this in half means that I've had to double my force so that the pressure 
you know, or, um, well, if I wanted the pressure to remain the same, excuse me, but here, right, I've cut, I've cut the area in half, so that my pressure is two times bigger than the original pressure, right, where the area was the full size, okay, so, Pressure in a liquid. This is what we really care about. After all, this chapter is called liquids. And, you know, we, obviously pressure does apply to solids. We just talked about the bed of nails and the foot idea. But that's about it. You know, most of the time we talk about pressure, we talk about fluids, which is why we haven't introduced it up to the chapter where we introduce fluids or liquids, that is. So, you know, that, that's, that's kind of the, the reasoning behind it is, yes, you can apply it to solids, but it's kind of boring, not very, not very useful. But for liquids, it's crucial. Okay. So, Force per unit area that a liquid exerts on an object, that it is depth dependent. Okay, I mentioned that. We'll see why. And not volume dependent because we're dividing by the area. Okay, every pool of the same depth exerts the same pressure at the bottom, regardless of the total volume of the pool. Okay, swim twice as deep, then twice as much weight of water is above you produces twice as much pressure on you. Okay, it doesn't matter if you swim twice as deep in a lake or a swimming pool. Obviously, very different volumes between the lake and the swimming pool but the depth is all that matters, okay? Okay, so other things about the pressure is it acts equally in all directions. So if I imagine a cube that's underwater somewhere, the pressure is acting on all sides of that cube, okay? All right, now this cube needs to be infinitesimally small for all those pressure values to be identical, but the point being is pressure acts in all directions because after all, it's being exerted by a, a liquid and that liquid can push in every direction. It's not like an object that's just pushing in a single direction because the liquid doesn't have a well-defined shape. It's trying to fill in that volume. Thus, the force per area that it exerts is omnidirectional. It's in every direction, okay? Furthermore, it is a vector, okay? Pressure is a vector. It's just often we don't care about it so much as a vector after all because it's pointing in so many directions at once. There's not, you know, it's sometimes we don't, it's directionality is, oh, well, it's in every direction, okay? But it is a vector, all right? So your ears fill, feel, not fill, your ears feel the same amount of pressure underwater no matter how you tip your head, okay? And that's assuming that your tip doesn't appreciably change the depth of your head, okay? The bottom of a boat is pushed upward by pressure. Oh yeah, so pressure can definitely push up. Absolutely, okay? That's gonna be a big deal when we talk about buoyancy. Pressure acts upwards when pushing a beach ball underwater, right? You, you, you pull that beach ball underwater and you release it and it comes shooting up out of the water, right? So that's an example of pressure pushing in all directions, okay? But then you might wonder, well, why did it shoot up if it's pushing in all directions? That's because it doesn't push equally in all directions. The push from the bottom is small, is greater, not smaller, but the push from the bottom is greater than the push from the top. But why is that? Because for the bottom is deeper and that difference matters, okay? So only a cube like this that is assumed to be really, 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 really small could actually have pressure equal on all sides, okay? Okay, so other things about, about pressure is independent of the shape of the container. Whatever the shape of the container, the pressure at a particular depth is the same. That was my lake swimming pool analogy, okay? Now we could have these you know, kind of fancy dem demonstration devices where it doesn't matter if it's like a curly cue or this little shape, right, with different spheres. All of these would have the same pressure at the same depth, regardless of the shape, all right? Even this one that's much wider, right? Maybe, oh, there's a lot, a lot more liquid above. Okay, so yeah, sure, this weighs more, this volume of liquid, but the, the force per area is the same because that's what pressure is, all right? So it's weight density divided by times depth, okay, is the actual form of liquid pressure. This is often called hydrostatic pressure, okay? So this is a very useful equation because this tells us how to calculate pressure at a particular depth. You just need to know the weight density and the depth. Okay, and what is, the, what is the, the weight density? Okay, well, it's just going to be the density of the fluid, okay, times gravity times depth, all right? Because what, after all, what was weight density? Weight density is newtons per square meter, all right? So let's, let's do a quick, quick run through here, right? It's gonna show up in equation four, but I wanna remind you, okay? So first of all, we have density, okay? I usually write density of the Greek letter rho, and density is kilograms per cubic meter, okay? Weight density, on the other hand, is rho times g, because it's a weight. We need gravitational acceleration. It's planet-specific, right? Whereas density is just mass. It's more universal. It would be the same on Venus and Earth, right? Okay? But here, 
right? For example, right? Nothing special about Venus, okay? Um, but here, the rho times g, that makes it a weight density. And so then if we think about the units, well, now it's newtons per cubic meter, all right? Sorry if I said square meter, but anyway, it's per cubic meter, okay? As opposed to density being kilograms, because we've multiplied by g, changing our, our m up in the numerator into an n, okay? Make sense? All right, so that's weight density. So that means that the action, we go back to this, that means that the equation is then just going to be rho g, and then for depth, let's say y. So right there, that's it. Density, gravitational acceleration, depth. Density, kilograms per cubic meter. Gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. Y, measured in meters, right? Mm, two meters deep, six feet, okay? Um, 30 meters deep, right? Uh, about 100 feet, okay? So whatever, whatever the depth may be, okay? And density, by the way, density for water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, okay? And the density for air is one kilogram per cubic meter, at least at sea level, all right? Water density doesn't change much, air density changes dramatically. That's, you know, the whole thing about gases. And we'll talk more about air later because we'll talk about gases in the next chapter, okay? Liquids aren't very compressible, gases are. But there you go, right? Kind of interesting values about common, common types of densities that you'll see a lot of. Okay, so water pressure provided by a water tower is greater if the tower is, holds more water, uh, both, just taller. It's all that matters, okay? It's independent of the actual size of the tower. The only thing that's gonna set the pressure of that water tower is its height, all right? The, all right, the amount of water is great for maybe, you know, having a better reservoir, you know, bit, you know one that will long, run longer and not run out in the drought or something, but that's it, right? The amount of water does not affect the pressure at all. Okay, so let's get to this idea about the depth and the pressure and the unidirectionality I talked about, well, omnidirectionality. All right, so here we have it, right? Those are the little, the pressure vectors, okay? So the effects of water pressure, it acts perpendicular to the surface of a container, right? Or in this, this triangle, right, it's acting, acting on the surface, okay? The, li um, the liquid spurts out right angles from a hole in the surface, all right? Because it's gonna come out exactly perpendicular, okay? In this case, I, I, I would suppose he actually perpendicular to be a little bit angled because our cup is angled, but you know, notwithstanding, you know, maybe not the great, best, best diagram, but it gets the job done. All right, the greater the depth, the greater the exiting speed, okay? Because it's bigger pressure, right? There's bigger pressure down here than up here. And that greater pressure means that there's a greater force per area, which means there's a greater acceleration, which means that, oh, excuse me, I stop doing that, which means that V naught here is larger and V naught up here is smaller, okay? Big V naught. For those reasons, greater, greater pressure, greater force per area. All the holes are the same size, right? That means greater force. Greater force means greater acceleration by Newton's second law. Greater acceleration by kinematics means greater initial velocity. And if you don't you know, want to think about all those steps, you can just memorize that the holes at the bottom come out, have water spurting out of them faster. And that's a pressure story, okay? But of course, pressure is related to everything else because physics is all about building ideas on top of other ideas, okay? So. I mentioned the idea of buoyancy and that the beach ball shoots up out of the water because the pressure at the bottom of the ball is greater than the pressure on the sides, especially on the top, okay? Well, that's buoyancy. That is, that is what buoyancy is, and that's this picture right here, okay? It is the apparent loss of weight of the submerged object, and it is equal to the weight of the water displaced, okay? So that, that's the quick way to calculate it. So if I found the volume of this potato, all right, potato, okay? I, find, I look at that potato underwater, and I say, okay, well, it's got, so it's got some particular value, all right, some particular volume, and I look at that volume, and then I find out the volume of water that, 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 that is equal to the volume of the potato, then the, the buoyant force is exactly equal to the mass of the water that would fill in that volume times gravity, because that would be the weight of the water displaced every single time. And in this case, since the, the potato is completely underwater, its volume that it's displaced is equal to its own volume, right? Okay, but look at the picture. Look how the pressure vectors at the bottom are larger than the ones at the top. So that means that the net change in pressure is up. So then the net force is up, and that's what we call the buoyant force, okay? FB for the buoyant force. All right, 
And it's all because there's slightly greater pressure at the bottom, no matter how small the object is, that difference always matters, okay? And then that's going to create a net force up, which means it will accelerate up, okay? If its weight is not greater than the water, okay? Because buoyant force always acts, even on sinking objects. I, th I throw a lead block in water, and it certainly it sinks, but it still has a buoyant force, and its buoyant force is still equal to the weight of the water displaced. But in that case, its gravitational force is greater than the buoyant force. That's what makes it sink. Okay? So the displacement rule. A complete, this is restating what I just said, but putting it in the slide, okay? A completely submerged object always displaces a volume of liquid equal to its own volume, okay? And that's a completely submerged. Notice that, notice that, okay? Place a stone in the container that is brimful of water, and the amount of water that overflows to the top equals the volume of the stone. That's a great, great way to find it for, to measure volume, okay? Because otherwise, how are you going to calculate volume, right? You can, if it's unusual shape, you can't use some formula. There's no geometric formula, you know, it's not, if it's not a perfect sphere, for example, okay? All right, so a cook who measures a, a specific amount of butter by placing it in a measuring cup with water, uh, with water in it, is using what? Yep, the displacement rule, okay? So, the buoyant force, the net upward force that a fluid exerts on an immersed object equals the weight of the, of the water displaced, okay? That's so important because it's straightforward to calculate, okay? The difference in the upward and downward forces acting on the storage block is the same at any depth, Okay? Now that is assuming that the density of the fluid doesn't change. And that's definitely true for water. I mean, you can go down to the bottom of the like, deepest trenches in the ocean and the, the density of the water has only changed by like less than 1%. So for all intents and purposes, we can definitely treat water as a constant density, okay? And that's why we can confidently say that, you know, there's all, yeah, there's gonna be a, a bigger, right? There's definitely more pressure down here, but there's also more pressure on the top. And the difference between the two is always the same. That's what this picture is showing, right? Here, there's not a lot of depth pressure, but there's even left, less depth, depth pressure at the top. So the difference is the same. Okay, in this case, one arrow, right? Same here, right? Both, both the bottom and top pressures have grown because they grow of depth, okay? But they've grown proportionally, so the difference is the same, okay? And that difference leads to the buoyant force. It leads to a net, a net force up, okay? Now, that's just the net force leads to the buoyant force. I'm not saying that gravity can't be greater than it. I already said objects can sink, but objects always experience a buoyant force, okay? And the formula, by the way, is just going to be the density of, of the water, okay? Okay, you know, you can put things in fluids out of the water, right? You can, you can put in liquid mercury so, or, you know, or lava or something. And then times gravity and then times the volume displaced. Okay, so for this, this block here or for this potato, let's go back to it, or this rock or that potato, for all those objects, the volume displaced would be equal to the volume of the object. Okay, so the volume displaced equals the volume of the object when completely submerged. Okay, which is a lot of situations, especially in this class, because when it's half submerged, it's a little complicated to calculate, where you have to think about how much is submerged. But it's good to remember that that doesn't always apply. Okay, it only apply, applies to completely submerged. But when they are, displaced equals object in terms of volume. All right, so how many forces act on a submerged body at rest in a fluid? Think about it. Okay, because we're treating buoyant as one force, even though, you know, some of many pressure forces, but how many? All right, two. It's got to be, because you can't, you can't be at rest with only one force. Okay, think, think F net equals MA. The only way for A to be zero is for F net to have some F1 minus F2. So you have to have two forces to be at rest. In this case, you've got the buoyant force pointing up and gravity pointing down. If they're equal and opposite to each other, okay, they're not a force pair because they both act on the same object, but if they're equal and opposite to each other, then they create an equilibrium situation. All right? Okay, so sink or float. Sink when the weight of the submerged object is greater than the buoyant force. We mentioned that, like the lead block. Neither sink nor float when the weight of a submerged object is exactly equal to the buoyant force. That object will remain at any level. It's called neutral buoyancy. So it's hard to get, you know, just right. But that'd be like if you had something and you like, you know, put, put it down like, you know, six inches beneath the surface of the water and it just stayed right there. It neither rose back into the surface nor sunk to the bottom. Okay, that's, that's perfectly neutrally buoyant. Okay. Or at least it, it's so close to neutral buoyancy that it's seller, it's seller, it's its acceleration is only like millimeters per second um, squared. So, you know, it's very, so it's hardly gonna move, all right? And float is when the weight of the submerged object is less than the buoyant force it would have when submerged. When floating, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the floating object. So that's always actually quite easy to calculate in that regard. I know that the, the volume displaced business is harder for floating objects because not the, the whole volume of the object is submerged. However, 
What's nice about the forces is that we can always say that the buoyant force exactly equals the weight of the object because it is also an equilibrium and it's an equilibrium right at the surface, but it's not fully submerged, right? Okay, all right, so. And continuing on with Archimedes' principle, which is closely re related to buoyancy, we have that it was discovered by the Greek scientist Archimedes. As I said, it relates to buoyancy um, or relates buoyancy to displaced liquids. What it basically says, and it's nothing we haven't said before, it just puts it, gives a title to a particular idea. It states that an immersed body, completely or par partially, is buoyed up or buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid it displaces. Okay, that's kind of the definition of the buoyant force. It applies to gases and liquids, so it could apply, apply to a hot air balloon as well as um, you know, a raft floating in a lake, okay? And it, it basically looks like this. So the apparent weight, okay, that's kind of a new term, of a submerged object. So it's the weight out of water minus the buoyant force. All right, so for example, if a three kilogram block submerged in water apparently weighs two kilograms, then the buoyant force or weight of the water displaced is one kilogram, okay? So we could use that to find the density of the fluid in which the object is being submerged, for example, because then we would know based on the volume of the object and that, that difference between the apparent weight and the true weight, um, you know, we could use that to find the weight of the, of the dispersed liquid and then find the density of the liquid. Okay, so that's, that's definitely one use of the buoyant force or Archimedes principle. Um, it has also been applied to the idea of finding the density of unknown materials, like confirming that an object is gold, for example. All right, so let's take a look at that. On which of these blocks submerged in water is the buoyant force greatest? Okay, so one kilogram of lead, one kilogram of aluminum, one kilogram of uranium, or are they all the same? Because they all have the same mass, all right? And if you don't know, uranium is one of the densest um, you know, naturally occurring elements out there. Um, lead is less dense than, uh, than uranium, and aluminum is less dense than both lead and uranium, okay? And the density matters because it's the, it's the aluminum, okay? It's the one kilogram of aluminum, because that's the largest. Because they have a kilogram of aluminum, that, that, it must have a greater volume than the kilogram of uranium or lead, all right? Therefore, it's displaced more fluid. They're all being submerged in the same fluid, water, and so that must be the greatest buoyant force, because the buoyant force is equal to the displaced liquid, all right? Or displaced water. And they all sink, okay? Because they're all denser than water. So when a fish expands its air bladder, the density of the fish, what happens? Okay, but you can think about that. It simply decreases, all right? Um, and by the way, this is the wrong, wrong comment there. Sorry for the, for the typo, okay? So when a fish makes itself less dense, the buoyant force on it does what? So I think, because this is the natural thing the fish do, right? They can expand, expand that air bladder, therefore change their density, and what happens to their buoyant force? Does it increase or decrease, okay? Because they made themselves less, less dense by expanding the air bladder, all right, what would, would the fish go up or down? Okay, got an answer? It increases, okay? So it actually allowed them to go up because now they're bigger, they're taking up more space, they're displacing more fluid, and now they're gonna start actually floating up, okay? They'll accelerate up gradually. When the fish decreases it, the size of its air bladder, the density of the fish does what? Okay, but you can guess, it simply increases, okay? And when a submarine takes water into its ballast tanks, what happens to its density? Okay, it increases. And what, what happens when you increase your density? All right, well, when you increase your density, then you're going to sink, all right? So when, um, when a submarine expels water from its ballast tank, its density, but you know this, we've done a lot of these already, right? It decreases, all right? And that's how they're able to surface, okay? They, whatever water they took on, that allowed them to sink. They expel it, they pump it out, all right? The air fills in that space and they're able to rise, all right? All they need is a pump, okay? So that might be how a submarine goes up and down, but how's a boat float, all right? Well, the principle of flotation is something we've kind of already hinted at, but maybe it's been an open question or maybe it's been a question in the back of your mind. A floating object displaces a weight of fluid equal to its own weight, okay? So a solid, iron one ton block may displace one eighth ton of water and sink. Okay, because see it's displaced a volume that's equal to it, all right? Water is one eighth as dense as iron and therefore the buoyant force, this vector here, that arrow, is much smaller than the gravitational force, that vector, thus the iron block accelerates downwards, it sinks, okay? But 
If we reshape that same one ton of iron into a bowl shape, then it can displace a greater volume of water. And as long as we get the shape right, so the water isn't spilling over the side, right? We just gotta make sure it has a nice, nice edge there. Now we can dis displace an equal, basically weight of water as the weight of the iron, okay? And it will float. And it doesn't have to be exactly equal. In fact, here, it's, we're kind of implying that we're displacing more than enough water because it's not floating right at the water line, right? We've got excess you know, edge, which is good because water tends to slosh around, right? But that's the idea. It's just about the shape, okay? But it's gotta be a bowl shape, right? It has to, it has to be some sort of bowl, right? You know, obviously boat shapes are bowl shapes, okay? So the reason a person finds it easier to float in salt water compared to fresh water is that salt water, what is it, okay? Neither of these, okay? And what our options were the buoyant force is greater or the person feels less heavy. The reason is because of the density of the water. Salt water is denser than fresh water. That denser water means that you're going to float higher. There's actually gonna be a greater proportion of your volume above the surface. This is somewhat noticeable in the ocean versus a freshwater lake. It's especially noticeable in high salty waters like the Salton Sea in California, okay? It's actually a dramatic demonstration of that. Um, you'd feel it on your own body, You'd notice it on a boat, the boat would float much higher than it normally would, okay? So on a boat ride, the skipper gives you a life preserver filled with lead pellets. When he sees the skeptical look on your face, he says that you'll experience a greater buoyant force if you fall overboard than your friends who wear styrofoam filled preservers, right? So is he right or is he wrong, okay? He's correct, but what he doesn't tell you is you'll drown. <laughs> Your life preserver will submerge and displace more water than those of your friends who float to the surface. Although your buoyant force will be greater, your net force downward is greater still and you will accelerate down. Okay? But he was absolutely right. You will, in fact, experience a greater buoyant force. All right? <laughs> it's kind of like a legalese explanation of why this uh, particular uh, skipper is trying to kill you. I'm not sure why. Okay? All right. So anyway, um, you place an object, another kind of uh, interesting flotation idea. You place an object in a container that is full to the brim with water on a scale. The object floats, but some water spills out. We know, you know so it's going to displace an amount of water equal to the, um, basically equal to its weight, okay? And it's, an, it's well, it, so let's think about it this way, right? So the wood, hit, the wood block has a certain weight. It will displace water that is equal to its weight, but that will be less volume than the block because the, the wooden block is less dense than water. Say, say wood is about 800 kilograms per cubic meter, water is about 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So in other words, what, uh, wood is 80% as dense as water. And so then you're gonna have 20% you know, floating above the surface, um, you're gonna have 80% below the surface, and then you're gonna, you will displace an amount of water equal to 80% the volume of the wood, okay? Now, hopefully I didn't give away the answer. Okay, so the object floats, but some water spills out. Now I explained how much it was, right? How does the weight of the object compare with the weight of the water displaced? Okay, they have to be equal. They have to be, all right? Those have to be equal weights. They, they need not be equal volumes, okay? But they do have to be equal weights. So this, so this volume of the displaced water, disp for displaced, can be less than the volume of the object, okay? And that it will, will be true as long as the object has a density that is less than the density of water. And here I'm using that little p, which is the letter rho, all right? That, so this is the density of the object is less than the density of the water. And that's when the volume displaced will be less than the volume of the object, okay? Like so, okay? But their weights are equal. M times G for both of them is absolutely equal. Does that make sense, okay? Because mass, okay, it's a good kind of check here. Mass, I mean, you know, it's, this has been kind of implicit in a lot of this discussion, but I just want to say it, say it, absolutely. Mass is density times gravity, okay? So it's, um, oh, excuse me, that would be force. So, yeah, I'll start over. Mass is density times volume, okay? Because density is kilograms per cubic meter, volume is cubic meters, yeah, excuse me, so volume is cubic meters, density is kilograms per cubic meter. When you multiply them together, you get kilograms, all right? And so that, that is kind of the key idea that we keep coming back to. That is, that is so built into everything we talk about with buoyancy, 
Right? This is, the, if anything, the most governing equation of all this discussion. Okay. Um, so, further, further more interesting ideas. This is an interesting application. So this is called the Fal the Falkirk wheel, um, and so it's got these. Um, these big caissons that are brimful of water and the same weight, regardless of whether there are boats in them. This makes the rotation lifting almost effortless, right? So it's, it's kind of an alternative to a lock system like in the Panama Canal. Panama Canal. And the idea is they can, they can rotate these very, very easily because when the boat goes in, it actually doesn't change the weight. And so this big giant wheel is able to, to rotate you know, at, without, without any change, right? It's really remarkable engineering, right? Okay. so. A little bit more about uh, Archimedes' principle. Denser fluids will, exi will exert a greater buoyant force on a body than less dense fluids of the same volume. Okay, so that's we mentioned that ships will float higher in salt water because the density is about 3% um, greater. Okay, all right. Furthermore, it applies in air. So the more air an object displaces, the greater the buoyant force on it. So if an object displaces its weight, it hovers at a constant altitude. If an object displaces less air, it will descend. Okay, so a hot air balloon that is hovering at a constant volume is in equilibrium. It's displacing just enough air to equal its weight. So the volume of displaced air um, it times its density gives a mass times gravitational acceleration gives a weight that is exactly equal to the weight of the balloon. Okay, so what that would look like, so we have the weight of the balloon, so W for weight. We have the weight of the air. Okay, so the weight of the balloon is just going to be the mass of the balloon times gravity. Okay, and I'm doing this especially because I, I, you know, I wrote the equation wrong a minute ago and I don't want to confuse the matter. So I want to show you an example where we would include gravity. And over here, the weight of the air would be the density of the air times the volume of the air displaced, okay, which would be equal to the volume of the entire balloon plus basket times gravity. Okay, so that's the idea. Now the mass of the balloon, you probably wouldn't use a, a density times um, volume for the balloon because maybe the balloon is composed of different things because right? the basket obviously has a different density than the, than the balloon. So the, the mass is just the entire thing. And that would just be a number you were given in a particular problem. All right. So as you sit in class, is there a buoyant force acting on you? Okay. Or as you sit at home watching this video, is there a buoyant force acting on you? Absolutely. Okay. Do the displaced air. You displaced air, there is a force acting on you. There has to be. Okay. Anytime you displace any, any fluid, which is air is considered a fluid, it's not a liquid, it's a gas, and we'll talk about gases in the next chapter, but it turns out that certain things liquids and gases have in common, and one is their ability to exert buoyant forces. Okay? That's why there's a term called a fluid that applies to both liquids and gases. Okay? One of the reasons. All right. So what makes an object float or sink? Whether an object floats or sinks depends upon the volume of the object and the volume of the fluid displaced. Right? We've talked about that. It's just, and so that comes out to the idea, is the gravitational force, you know, is Fg you know, greater than or equal to the buoyant force because it will sink if fg is greater and it will it will either you know float or rise up if fg is less than the buoyant force so for an object to float the weight of the object is less than the buoyant force of the liquid less than the weight of the liquid it displaces all right that is the idea can't repeat it enough right so what makes an object float or sink an object more dense than the fluid in which it is immersed will sink that's number one that's our rule number two rule an object less dense than the fluid in which it is immersed will float Third rule, an object having a density equal to the density at which it is immersed will neither sink nor float. That's a neutral buoyancy. It'll just remain at whatever level it's at, at the top, halfway down, wherever, okay? In the particular um, volume of fluid. Two solid blocks of identical size are submerged in water. One block is lead and the other is aluminum. Upon which is the buoyant force greater? Oh, we did this one, excuse me, okay? Um, so this one um, is the same for both. Oh, I forgot, actually, we didn't do this one because here we're told that they're identical size, not identical mass. Okay, so important difference between, between these two problems, right? And I, and I don't want to rush through it. Before, we were told that they were all one kilogram, if you recall, all right? But now, we're not. Instead of them all being one kilogram, they're all the same size, whatever size that may be. And since they're all the same size, and they're all denser than water, so they're all sink, they will all experience the same buoyant force, okay? So that's the idea. If the, if the size is the same, then the volume displaced is the same, that means same buoyant force. Get it? Okay? So now another application, okay, we're moving, moving beyond buoyant force now. Now onto this conservation of energy idea. Also applies to fluids, and we'll talk more about some stuff with fluids, that is liquids and gases in the next chapter. So you can kind of see, we can't, uh, some ideas bleed over between the two chapters, between liquids and gases, we can't help it. All right, so this is conservation of energy, okay. So Pascal's princi principle, discovered by Blaise Pascal, a scientist and theologian in the 17th century, okay states that a change in pressure at any point in an enclosed fluid at rest is transmitted undiminished to all other points. 
So the pressure here, we call this pressure in, has to equal pressure out. Those same pressures can't change. You can't just have, pressure just can't disappear. Why? Because energy can't disappear, all right? Because essentially pressure is force times area, okay? So then if you think about, okay, so you got a force and you got an area, you multiply that by a distance. Say if I push on this piston here, call this a piston. If I push a certain distance, I, call, I, have that, I call that D. Well, now what have I done, right? Well, now I have a pressure per area times the distance, okay? And so then what I've got is I, got, I have this, this conservation of energy because now I have force times distance, okay? Here, let me, see, let me show you, all right? So pressure, okay, which is force per area times distance, okay? Well, then we have force per area times D. What, well, D has um, units of meters. Area here has units of meters squared, okay? So then we're going to end up with this idea of, of, the, of a force, a force um, over a distance, okay? So this, you know, so this is going to lead, I'll just kind of be vague about this, but this is going to lead to work, okay? There's going to be a, con there's going to be whatever work you put in has to be the same as the work out, okay? So applications in um, hydraulic presses. So a pressure applied to the left piston is transmitted to the right piston. A 10 kilogram load on the small piston lifts a fi 500, kilogram pist um, five ki 500 kilogram load on the larger piston. Okay, because the area here, if we have 50 times the area here, we'll get 50 times the force. So it's, it's, it's essentially a liquid lever. Because you think about a lever, you apply a force over a much longer lever arm, you get multiplication of the force depending on the length of the lever arm. So if I apply a force of one newton, newton on a lever that is one meter long, and I apply one, one newton of force on a lever that's two meters long, I get twice, you know, twice the, the torque or twice the work, okay? So same idea here. It's, it's simple multiplication. Whatever, so here, my force times area must be the same as my force times area, all right? So since here I had an area of one, all right? Here I have an area 50 times as large, so my force is 50 times as large, okay? It's, so it is, it is simple as that, okay? So because it, it, it has to be, oh, it's force per area, excuse me. So because it has to be the same. The ratio has to be the same, right? Because here it was 10 over one. Over here, it's 500 over 50. Well, right, same ratios. See it? Okay, so that's because the pressure in has to equal the pressure out. So does the work in have to equal the work out. And that means whatever the distance here is great, maybe you push a really long ways, and then you just get a little bit of lift, okay? Because you get 50 50 times as less lift as the input, okay? So applications for gases and liquids seen in everyday hydraulic devices used in construction. Here's an example of a car, like a car hydraulic lift, all right? So on a hydraulic de um, devices, it is impossible for, okay? This is this idea I've been talking about. So here it is. If you understand that whole idea of work in equals work out, you'll be able to answer this question, okay? Okay, because that, this is true and so is this, pressure in equals pressure out. Okay, because you're not getting force for nothing. It's true, you're getting, you know, you, you have a much bigger output piston and all of a sudden you got a much bigger force. It seems like it's just like, oh, free force. But of course that's not the case. Something had to be diminished and that was the distance that that larger piston moved that's lifting the larger object. Okay, so the energy output cannot exceed the energy input. All right, okay, so a couple last topics here. Surface tension. Um, the contracted tendency of the surface of liquids is due to surface tension. So when you submerge a wire in water and pull it out with a spring, the spring stretches, all right? When you place a paintbrush in water and pull it out, the water contracts and pulls the hair together, all right? That's the water tension, surface tension. So other examples, drops of any kind are spherical because their surface tension tends to contract and force each drop to sh into their certain shape, okay? Applies to bubbles as well. Okay, so that surface tension is a, is, a, is a force, all right? If it's overcome, then it can cause accelerations. Um, that's actually a mechanism of certain plants to launch seeds. They'll actually use surface tension force to kind of like, like store energy in that surface tension and release it just like a spring stores energy, okay? So surface tension, it has a particular molecular explanation, all right? So it's caused by the uh, molecular attraction of those H2O molecules. Beneath the surface, uh, each molecule is attracted in every direction by the neighboring molecules. A molecule on the surface of the liquid is pulled only by the neighbors on each, other, on each side and on downward from below. The 
there's no pull upward, all right? So these mo this, this molecular attractions tend to pull the molecules from the surface into the liquid, liquid thus causing surface tension, okay? So um, factors affecting surface tension, the type of liquid. So water has a really great surface tension, much greater than a fluid like oil. Um, what is mixed with the liquid? So soap, soapy water has a lower surface tension than water without soap. Okay, so think like bubbles, all right? And the temperature of the liquid, the molecules in a hot liquid have higher energy and are not bound together as in a cooler liquid, all right? So, you know, so if, if it's too hot, then you're not gonna have um, as well-defined surface tension, okay? So another idea that's kind of related to molecular forces and um, like surface tension is the idea of capillarity. So the rise of a liquid in a fine hollow tube or in a narrow space is called capillarity. It happens in plants, happens in like pipettes. So adhesion between the molecules of the glass and the water draws the film of the water into the tube. Okay, so case in point, right? So surface tension causes the film on the surface to contract. This raises the liquid from below and it rises up in the tube. All right, when the force of the surface tension balances out from the weight of gravity, right? So this would be the gravitational force going down this way, right? And here's the force from the surface tension going up. All right, when they balance out, it stops rising and it reaches an equilibrium state. All right, so the height of the rise depends on, upon the weight of the liquid and the narrowness of the tube. All right, so the lighter the liquid and the higher the, uh, the higher the capillarity and the narrower the tube, the higher the capillarity. All right, so you can have a very narrow tube and a very low density liquid and you can get really dramatic capillarity effects. All right, so oil rises in a wick. All right, so you can, um, you can have like, um, you know, you, you can have all these like systems. Um, uh, what's, a, what's a really good example of that? Um, kerosene lamps, okay? Kerosene lamps are based on capillarity. Okay, so that low, low density oil, oil is lower density than water. And so it's gonna be, it would, work, it would work with water as well, but it's gonna work even better with oil. That oil rises, rises up between all the little spaces in that wick, thus allowing it to burn at the top. Have you seen a kerosene lamp? Okay, so they're, they, they function on capillarity, okay? It's a really, at least a really convenient, convenient way for them to function. Um, Hair let loose in a bathtub causes the scalp to get wet, and insects have a hard time getting out of water when their legs get wet. All examples of capillarity. All right, so I hope all these ideas about liquids have been interesting, um, and hopefully you also see um, these the connections that I'm making with the material in the next, next chapter with gases, because we're gonna talk about you know moving gas and moving liquid, again, in the context of moving fluids. So look forward to that, um, and I uh, look forward to any questions on this context, on this uh, content. All right, well, thank you so much for watching this lecture video.